Good morning. Good morning. How are we doing today? Doing well? I got some thumbs up, some of these. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Roseville. If you're still up and about, find your seats. It would be a good time. So if this is your first time, we are glad you're here. Stick around. We'd like to get to know you a little bit. Let's get through some of these announcements. Let's see. First of all, we had a youth dessert auction on Friday night. Thank you for all who attended. We had a lovely time, and the youth uh, gained over $600 in their account. So that's great for upcoming winter camps, et cetera, et cetera. So 
Thank you for that. So we have Bible studies throughout the week. Uh, so if you are not involved in one, it's not too late to jump in with both feet. Women, you are in the book of Exodus, so you're studying Exodus, and that's on Thursday still, I believe. Uh, we have, we just finished our men's retru- uh, retreat, how do you say that? Men's Bible study in Revelation. So to this upcoming Tuesday, that's two days from now, there is a, what do they have it called here? A... Missions, movie, and munchies night. That's it. It's quite a mouthful. So, men, if you uh, uh, want to come join us, that would be great. Movies, uh, movie, munchie, and missions. Okay, anyways, you get the point. So that is this Tuesday. Uh, The Bible bus will not be meeting because you guys are going to the Reunion Gospel Mission to serve there. So that's on Wednesdays. Uh, Let's see. So we do not know where we'll be going next in Bible study yet, right? So... We'll see. Stay tuned for that. Uh, Operation Christmas Child. The large pyramid back there has dwindled now to more of a ziggurat, so that's a good thing. Uh, You can take a few more if you want on your way out uh, for Operation Christmas Child, obviously. The due date is November 19th, which is less than a month now. Donations with it, $9 to cover it for shipping and handling, but if you can't afford the 9 bucks, don't worry about it. Just fill it and bring it, okay? Uh, let's see, we have a need still of Sunday school teachers, uh, class helpers needed, one Sunday a month, if you can do that, contact Angela. Uh, let's see, projection and sound service needed, contact Mary Ann if you want to help out. Training provided on the job, and it's free, doesn't cost you anything. Uh, volunteer learning projection part, we have that person, but we still need a volunteer to learn the sound system. It says it is not hard, but important. My wife disagrees. It is hard, but don't let la- don't let that uh, change your heart. If you can help out, that would be great. Yes, see, it's not hard. It just isn't. Okay, so we have also need for ushers and greeters as well. So if you want to do that, contact Randy. Although he's still on vacation, I believe. Don't contact him right now. Oh, never mind. Wrong, Randy. Yeah. Sorry, wrong, Randy. Contact him if you want to help out there. So uh, let's see here. I think that is about it. If we can have the ushers come forward for this morning's offering. Also, a great time to silence your cell phone or electrical device. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the breath in our lungs and the song in our hearts. Lord, we thank you that we can gather in your name to learn more about you and what you have done for us and what you have planned for us. Bless these tithes and offering. Use them for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning we're blessed, are we not? Amen. Thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. and Thank you, Lord, for your word. We're continuing in our reading of Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 1. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a serving to seven and also to eight. For you do not know what evil will be on the earth. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it shall lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regrets the clouds will not reap. As you do not know what is the way of the wind or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child, so you do not know the works of God who makes everything. In the morning, sow your seed, and in the evening, do not withhold your hand. For you do not know which will prosper, either this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Truly, the light is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eyes to behold the sun. But if a man lives many years and rejoices in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. All that is coming is vanity. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these God will bring you into judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from your heart and put away evil from your flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. Praise the Lord. He calls us to grow in him. Amen. To become mature in the word and to know that everything that we do in this life is vanity other than the things that we do to store up treasures in heaven. Let's be people of the word, amen. Thank you, Jesus.
change you do not move uh, the world is rocking and rolling and we often feel we are lost at sea but you indeed are our anchor and we thank you and praise you for this focus our hearts and minds now on your word in jesus name amen jesus is our anchor Steadfast and sure here at CCR. Amen? Amen? Okay, the light's just a little bit down. I know live stream needs light, but sometimes that's good for me. I hope it, I'm not. They say sometimes that we can look like a ghost with white hands and face on live stream. Man, this complicated world we live in. This morning we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, where we left off last week as we faithfully continue to go through the Word of God, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. This morning I'd like to ask you to pray for Chris Verger. His father passed away last night. He's with the family right now. Chris is with the family and comforting them. And we'll lift that up in prayer. Lord, we lift up the Verger family, Father God. And the father was ailing, but it was unexpected nonetheless. And even when we expect it, it's always a season of sorrow and loss. Even though we know the person's in heaven and they're a Christian, but still, there's that sense of loss. And we pray for Chris as he ministers to the family. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. And then on a lighter note, we have Bill here. It's his birthday this morning. And so happy birthday, Bill. Cindy, his wife, let me in on the secret. Thank you, Cindy. All right, people. Bill back there, Phil Clark, sitting here at 10 to 10, and says, what's going on? Is the service in the cafe? There's more people in the cafe right now chatting than there are out here. And I said, no, Phil. It's tardiness. <laughs> it's being late. And we really have, like, gone the extreme where it's like at 10 after, people are still coming in. Now, I'm talking to Dan Gillen about it this morning, and he said, yeah, but then 
you know, you do talk a lot about tardiness, and then what happens is there are those who don't want to come because they know they're going to be late, and they say, oh, no, we don't want to upset Pastor Ken. No, I'm not upset if you come in late. It's just that we want to be people who are on time, or at least close to being on time. Now, you see, some people say, well, I come to church on Sunday morning, and I really don't get that much out of it. You know, I can just watch on live stream. And we have a whole group out there watching on live stream. Now, now Della's out there. Hi, Della. And I'm not saying that, or, that you should be able to make it here when you can't drive, you can't see, and all these different things. And we're glad to provide that. But there is a thing about you know, being on time for Sunday. And when people say, well, I, I don't you know, get a lot out of coming in, and well, you don't get a lot out of fellowshipping with the brethren? You don't get a lot out of live worship? Or being able to, to look me in the eye, so to speak? Well, you see, there's reasons. One reason is our culture and our lifestyle. I will give you that. Now, if you're rushing around all day Saturday trying to pack three days into one, well, guess what? You're probably going to be frazzled when it comes to, to Sunday morning. If you're going to bed at midnight or one in the morning or even 11 o'clock at night, well, guess what? You're probably not going to be so sharp on Sunday morning. Amen? And so think about these things. Sunday's important, very important in the life of the believer. And if you make it so frantic on Sunday morning because you're way behind in time and you're rushing around, you're trying to get here, and then there's that turtle in front of you while you're driving, and next thing you know, there's some road work or something, and you get stressed out, and you get here, and then you know, your, your mind isn't clear. Your soul isn't prepared. Your spirit isn't calm. And we want that to be. You know, do things like on Saturday, pray about who may be here on Sunday morning who you can minister to. Whoa. Not just come, oh, well, you know, I have fellowship. Well, come thinking of who you might minister to. Amen? On, with your family on Saturday, pray about the offering that you're going to bring. Pray together about it. Make it special. The offering of your tithe, the offering of your life, of your obedience coming and fellowshipping with the brethren, not forsaking the gathering of the brethren. Amen? All these things. Decide what you're going to wear, gals, on Saturday, not on Sunday morning. You know, don't have a pile of clothes on the bed. You know, you try one thing on it, and you throw it in. And guys, we can be the same. You know, we, 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 what am I going to wear? Oh, no, that doesn't look good. And next thing you know, you know, the time's getting shorter and shorter for 10 o'clock. And you're getting more and more stressed. Leave early for church. Church is where you get refueled, refreshed. You get a rush of faith. Where else do you get it? We live in troubling times in case there's someone here who's been having their head like an ostrich in the sand or a turtle where you pulled in all your legs and your head and tail. You know, these are troubling times. A hundred miles from here in Santa Rosa, there are people who have had their lives literally burned up, and they have not recovered. There's many homes that were lost. There's over 6,000 homes, I believe, and people trying to, to find places. They're coming here to rent apartments, to try to find a place to live. They're living in tents in Santa Rosa still. It has not, you know, they have not recovered. It's going to take a long time before they do recover. They've lost lives. They've lost jobs. We see this on the news. It makes us stressed. It makes us tense. In Puerto Rico, 3,500 miles from here, it's been a month and there's no, 90% of the population has no electricity. The electricity grid has been destroyed. That's why. It may take at least six months before the 90% all have electricity again. Can you imagine what that's like? We're here at the potluck on Friday night. I'm looking at all the food back there, and I'm thinking, whoa, look at the abundance of food we have. We couldn't even eat it all. But here in Puerto Rico, they're in Puerto Rico, here in Santa Rosa, and of course there's the hurricane damage that people are still recovering from. All kinds of, of 
disasters and whatnot? Where do you go for peace? Where do you go to be refueled, to be refreshed, even if you're not right there in the midst of it, but you're looking on and it's building up in you. The world tension is rising, in case you haven't noticed. All kinds of threats. The terrorists planning, they, I just saw recently on TV that the ter terrorists are planning another 9-11. The chatter is on the internet and the communications that we capture from cell phones and whatnot. And so our forces are trying to do the best to find out what this is and put a stop to it, as so many are quelched every year. We never hear about these, these threats that, that the, the Department of Defense and whatnot are able to, to go in and take care of. The nuclear threat, the electromagnetic bombs that are, they, they are real. We're, some crazies out there could drop these electromagnetic bombs. They don't destroy human beings, but they kill all the technology. No internet. I don't know what's going on in Puerto Rico in the churches for the pastors who now have no internet to be able to, to help put their sermons together and whatnot. Probably, you know, what happens is simplicity. The title of the message today is Word Simple. Simply Word. That's the title, and that's the text, the simplicity of the word. Things have gotten so complicated. So you go to the store, and, and I went to the store to get a, a box of cereal, and there was literally a whole aisle, one side of the entire aisle. You know, the aisle was long, not some short aisle, of cereals. And I'm trying to pick out a cereal, literally 50 to choose from at least, literally. And that's what life is like. Germ warfare is a real thing. North Korea, cyber attacks. Now the Pentagon's really concerned about cyber attacks, not nuclear being the threat. North Korea, counterfeiting our money, money and flooding the financial markets with counterfeit $100 bills in order to undermine our economy. All kinds of stuff. Well, where do you go to get peace? Well, Paul tells us in the simplicity of the word, the word of God. But the apostle Paul was concerned about the church, concerned about the Corinthian church and the sacredness of the simplicity of the word, that it was being compromised, that they were being deceived, and that he was just a father trying to speak to his kids. He had birthed this church. He had started this church along with others. And he wrote 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, writing to Christians, mind you. These are not lost people. These are Christians. He says, Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly. And indeed, you do bear with me. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from what? From the immorality out there? From the greed out there? from the heresy out there. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent, the devil, deceived Eve by his craftiness, and the devil indeed is crafty, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. From the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. You may well put up with it. Simplicity. Simplicity that's in Christ. Now, in a nutshell, Paul's greatest fear was that the Christians at Corinth and in other churches would be deceived into falling for something other than the simplicity of the gospel of Christ. 
Simplicity is a key word in this passage. You see, faith is simple, people. It was never meant to be complicated. Amen? And what happened was God sent down the word of God, sent down Jesus, but he also sent the written word to us, the living written word. And he sent it to men, and those men recounted it, and they wrote it down for us throughout the ages. The simple word. In Luke chapter 4, verse 4, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Well, where do we get the word of God? We get it from the Bible. Amen? It was passed down in a very, very meticulous manner by scribes, many of which were Pharisees. But not all Pharisees were scribes. The scribes took great pains to make sure of the accuracy of their work as they transcribed guardians of the word. Old Testament, New Testament, same message. We are sinners, one and all, in need of a Savior, one Savior, Christ, who died for our sins, rose again, and will return. That is the message. Died on the cross for our sins. Paul was a New Testament guardian of the message, of the word. And when, when it came to the churches that he had authority over, it got to be very personal with Paul. He cared about each and every one of them. He cared about them collectively. It was very personal. In 1 Corinthians 4.15, chapter 4, verse 15, Paul had told the Corinthians, you have 10,000 instructors. And the Greek teachers, teachers were a dime a dozen, but not many fathers. You see, Paul was not only a guardian of the word, but he was called to guard the people of God. He was called to be their shepherd. Now this, of course, at Corinth was in dispute. A great part of the book, a great part of these letters that he writes to the Corinthians are because they're disputing his authority, disputing his calling, disputing whether the guy is even saved or not. We looked at that last week. Those who said, you're not of Christ. He's not of Christ. Now why... Did and does the word of God need to be guarded? Because we have an enemy. History tells us, although it was the sacred calling and duty of the scribes to study the law, to transcribe the word of God and write comments on it, they blew it. They messed up. We all mess up. We've been messing up throughout the ages. And the Old Testament scribes would copy and recopy the Bible meticulously, even counting letters and spaces. That's how meticulous they were. They wanted to ensure that each copy was correct, that it was the same. They wrote down every dot and every stroke, every tittle, it says in the Bible. That's every stroke of the original manuscripts. But the problem was they ended up going beyond the simplicity of it, and they started adding to it. They didn't just transcribe the scripture and interpret it simply, but they started adding man's traditions onto it and interpretations to what God had said. They became professionals at complicating the letter of the law while ignoring the simplicity of the spirit of the law. And things went south, and they went south in a big way. You see, Jesus consistently quoted out of the Old Testament scriptures. Consistently. And he spoke in parables, simple stories as well. Yes, the law is important. It pointed to the need of people, the need for us to have a redeemer, that we cannot keep the law. 
We all fall short. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were the example of righteousness. They made a profession, a career out of keeping the law, but they fell short. And that's why Jesus consistently and continually confronted them, got in their faces, because they thought they were so holy. In the end, simply put, Jesus Christ is the answer. In chapter 11, we see the heart of a father in Paul. First, in verses 1 through 4, his protectiveness for his family there at Corinth. And in verses 5 through 11, his generosity toward them. In verses 12 through 28, his anxiety about them. Are pastors anxious? Do I have anxiety about you? Indeed, I do. I do. Pastors, if you're a pastor, now teachers don't necessarily have anxiety for, for the people, but the pastor certainly must. Because we don't want to see you being ripped off. We don't want you on the, the bad end of John 10.10. 10. Abundant living is what we want for you. And so often I see people being ripped off in all kinds of ways, spiritually, emotionally, in marriage, financially. People come to me, and, and over the years, I've saved people thousands of dollars because they'll come, and sometimes I'll be able to direct them and say, no, don't, don't, don't buy that. It's a ripoff. Go check someplace else. Other times, it's a scammer, a huckster, trying to take their money. One family back east called about a member of this church who was a con man. We had, we, when that was revealed, we ousted him. But this family called from the Midwest. We're about to invest $250,000, Pastor, with this man, and he gave you as a reference. And I said, don't do it. Big mistake if you do that. Did they listen? No. Why? Because he was a con man. He was a huckster. He knew how to play them. They gave him $250,000. This guy is in Thailand with some suppo supposed factory making furniture and going to make millions, and they're going to make millions. Well, guess what happened to their $250,000, their retirement money, because this was an old elderly couple. Poof, gone. They called and told me. They said, we both have to go back to work in our 60s. Gullibility. Christians get snookered so easily. I think because we're so trusting. Stories on the internet. People come and they tell me the story off the internet. I say, wait a second here. I'm going to fact check. No. No. But we want to hear something. I remember when the Obamas were in office and, and many Christians just wanted to look for anything to, to find fault with them. Just like now there's so many out there trying to find fault with the president who sits in the White House now. And they came and said, oh, it was, it, Obamas have banned saying Merry Christmas. They've banned Christian ornaments on the trees. Well, go on the Internet and look up the video, the live video, not live, but the, the video of the Obamas in their final Christmas message. They not only say Merry Christmas, they say God bless America. They talk about Christ having come to earth. Ooh, the Obamas? Yeah, but we're so easily snookered into believing something. I'm not saying, I'm not purporting if they were Christian or not, because that's not up to me, that's up to God. I'm talking about gullibility. Now, gullibility is a word that's in the dictionary, is it? Gullible's in the dictionary. Is gullibility in the dictionary? Okay, I see people saying no. Every time I do this, sooner or later, it's like I repeat. Paul repeats all the time. He's repeating what we're going over right now. He's, he's already said this before, but gull, gullibility is in the dictionary. Sooner or later, you're going to catch on to my repeat jokes. But well, we are gullible. And Paul knew Christians are prone to gullibility, that they'd believe almost anything and everything on the Internet. Well, there was an Internet of its kind in that day as well. And Paul, quoting Paul, says, 
you hear all this stuff and you may well put up with it. You may well believe it. I'm going to read the Living Bible translation of verse 4. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 4. You seem so gullible, you believe whatever anyone tells you, even if he is preaching about another Jesus than the one we preach, or a different spirit than the Holy Spirit you received, or shows you a different way to be saved. You swallow it all. You may well believe it. You may well put up with it. He's talking to Christians, talking about Christians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, I mean, chapter 11, verse 1. Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly. And indeed, you do bear with me. Why does he say bear with me? Because they've been attacking him. There's been this group that's been attacking his credibility, his authority, his credentials, his qualifications, his ability as a speaker, as a presenter and communicator, doing all this. And so he says, well, bear with me. Some translations say... Boast, put the word boast in. And he says, indeed, you do bear with me. Now, I don't know what, if that's because Paul makes sure that they bear with him. Doesn't give them much choice. But don't forget, he's writing to his detractors there at Corinth. I know you don't respect me, Paul said, but nonetheless, I'm going to continue being the shepherd. And I'm going to tell you about it. Verse 2, for I'm jealous for you with godly jealousy. Two different kinds of jealousy, godly and human. For I have betrothed you. Now, this is a boast. I've betrothed you, Paul's saying, to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Who's that one husband that Paul is saying he has betrothed us to? Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. He's the groom. We're the bride. Good thing there's a cap on that. In Paul's day, it was the responsibility of the father of the family to ensure that his daughter was a virgin on her wedding day. Her virginity was something the groom would want guaranteed. And if she wasn't a virgin on that day, and they checked to make sure, what would happen is, the father would be shamed in the community because he did not do his job. He did not protect the purity, the holiness of his daughter. He did not protect the groom, her husband-to-be. Thus, as the spiritual father of the church at Corinth, it was Paul's responsibility to make sure that they remained in purity as much as it is humanly possible, that they weren't seduced by those who sought to learn, lure them away from the simplicity of the word of God. The simplicity of the gospel. Therefore, he had jealousy for those God had given him. A shepherd of the flock. He had a protectiveness for them that he lived and would die for. Now, Paul's was a godly jealousy, we're told. Human jealousy, on the other hand, messes things up. Cain was jealous of Abel. He was jealous that God accepted his brother's sacrifice and he killed his brother. That was the result of his jealousy. Sarah, jealous over Hagar because she had Ishmael. And that caused a monumental mess. Joseph's brothers were jealous because the father had given Joseph a multi-colored multi coat. And he was the father's favorite. So they tried to do away with him. Solomon was jealous over David, chased him, wanted to kill him. The Pharisees were jealous over Jesus. Why? Because people were following Jesus and they weren't following the Pharisees. And so the Pharisees tried to do Jesus in, and the result, the cross. Human jealousy is mingled with envy, selfishness, and, and many other things that aren't good. Now, Paul is pushing all that aside, 
And he's saying, this is my jealousy for God regarding this church. That's what I'm saying. I'm standing in this place as a father, having betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a virgin bride. Knowing I've done my job. Well done, good and faithful servant. He wanted to put them right alongside of Jesus, the groom, on that wedding feast day in heaven. Spotless and blemish free. Why? Because he had hammered them so much about their sin? Because he had given them so many tips on how to break bad habits? No, because of the simplicity of the cross, the simplicity of the message. They were saved. They were spotless. They were blemish-free because they repented of their sin because Jesus died on the cross. Jesus resurrected and Jesus will return. And I'll tell you, people, when I read this, he betrothed the church at Corinth. I say, well, I'm glad it wasn't me. I'm glad for those Corinthians because... Corinth would probably be the very last church I would have thought of betrothing to, to God. Because I'd choose Philippi, probably. Not Corinth, with all their messes and problems and attacks and whatnot. But Corinth. And that's a reminder. Now, a reminder to us that no matter what we've done in the past, who we've been, and even who we are now. God loves us. The simplicity is God loves us. Our sins are forgiven because Jesus died on the cross for our sins. We'll go to heaven. He'll return back to earth and set it all straight. And that's the gospel. Now, that was a different culture back then. Back then, like, it was different. Our culture is where... You know, you get the ring, you get the engagement ring. And maybe you keep it, maybe you end up giving it back. But in that culture, it didn't work that way. In that culture, the father chose by prearranged marriage who you were going to marry when you were a child, when you were both children, the bride and the groom. And then you grew up into adults and you got married. And then sometimes you said, Dad, man, you are the smartest guy on earth. You are so good, and you just picked the perfect one for me. Oh, yeah. And other times, it didn't work out quite like that. And it was, man, Dad, you were the dumbest man on earth when you picked that one for me. This isn't working out at all. But nonetheless, that's how it worked. The, the Hebrew culture, arranged marriage, and if on that wedding day the bride was found not to be a virgin, she could be put to death. Father shamed. The way it worked was the Hebrew wedding started at sundown. When the sun went down, that's when their day started back in that culture. And the groom could come at any time during the wedding day for the bride to get the wedding started. In Matthew 25, Jesus talked of the, of the wise maidens and the foolish maidens. It was all about having what? Oil for the lamps. Because as soon as the sun went down, usually the groom would go looking for his betrothed. And he'd need to be able to see them. And so if they had the lantern, they, they could be seen. He'd been waiting a year and was anxious to get this done. And as soon as the sun went down, the day started... Now, in our culture, it's the opposite. And many things are the opposite in our culture. In our culture, it's when the sun comes up that our day starts. Amen? And then they would blow a trumpet to let everyone know the groom's coming. Here comes the groom. And those at the wedding party, they had to have oil for the lamps. They'd all be gathered at the bride's father's house. And... At the father's house, the groom had built an addition on. At his father's house, he had built an addition on to the house. Actually, I think they were gathered at the, at the 
groom's father's house. And they, he had built an addition on for them to live in that room, a, a bedroom, basically. And if you didn't like your mother-in-law, well, too bad for you. That's, you got what you got. And Jesus said to us in John 14, 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know, the way is the imagery, imagery here. With the bride, when the bride was taken to the father's house, the feast would start. That's when it would start and go on for seven days. The groom would take the bride to that chamber. Everyone knew what was going on. The marriage was being consummated. She'd put a veil on his shoulder. He'd come out with that veil on his, on his shoulder, and the people would say, the government is upon his shoulders. You know, there were all these incredibly beautiful, tender, loving traditions that took place. It was really cool. And at the end of seven days of feasting, of the wedding feast, she'd come out from the feast considered a woman, mature. Now Jesus said, behold, I go and prepare a place for you. And he's going to hide us away for seven years during the tribulation. And then things will change. The honeymoon for the world will be over. Armageddon, the marriage supper of the Lamb. All the imagery is there. Now Paul, having been a Pharisee, he knows all this. He connects all this. And he's jealous over them. With God's very jealousy, not human jealousy. Because I have betrothed you to one husband, he tells them. Just one. Jesus. Simple simplicity. Amen? And it all sounds wonderful up to this point. They're saying, yeah, wow, cool, great. But I fear, in verse 3, and but, when you hear that word but, watch out. Whatever was said before, whatever preceded the word but, it may change drastically. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You see, you come to Christ, you're washed, you're cleansed. There's a simplicity to it. When I got saved, I didn't know what an epistle was. I didn't really know what an apostle was. I didn't know the songs, the worship songs. In fact, I didn't even have the ability to sing a song. When I would sing New Year's Eve with everyone, old Lang Syne, man, the people would move away from me because I was so off-key. Back before I became a Christian, I was in uninhibited because I'd been drinking so much. And I'd sing loud. And it was so bad. The people who led me to the Lord, Diane, one time she said to me when she came up to go... I was at church, or, and I think she came up here, and they were at church with us, and I was singing and she's with them, and, and she said, what happened? I, I go, what do you mean? She goes, when did you learn to sing like that? When I learned the worship songs, when the Holy Spirit opened my voice, that's when. And she goes, that is radical, because you were so bad. Not that I'm good now. but at least I can pass for a song. God did the work on my voice. I didn't know theology, Armenianism, Calvinism, propitiation. I didn't know anything. I just knew that I loved Jesus. And I just knew that I had to tell everybody about it, about him. And that Jesus was on my mind all day long, every day. Christmas time came, and I sent my Catholic brother-in-law a, a, a scripture mug. He felt like he had gotten mugged. <laughs> he tells the family, that was an inappropriate Christmas gift for him to send me, pushing his religion on, on me. Well, guy, you know, you're a Catholic, but you don't believe in the scriptures? The mug just had scriptures on it. 
But I, sure, I needed to grow. I needed to learn. I needed to mature. I needed to grow up. Sure. But my mind wasn't distracted from the simplicity in Christ. In this day and age, so many houses of worship have lost the simplicity. So many. We were up at the men's retreat, and some, we, we have cabin time with the pastors, and we talk. And a couple of the pastors said that the way they were talking about the volume for worship, and a couple of them said, well, you know how we do it? When it's louder than the congregation, we turn it down. That's how we do it. So different than the way it's being done today in churches. Today, the congregation is being ignored as far as how loud they are. It's this giant show with really loud. I remember in Jack Hayford's church down in Southern Cal, and they're tongue speakers, and I remember going to that church one Sunday and not really knowing much about the gift of tongues or anything, and like a thousand people, and during the worship, all of a sudden, they break out into t singing tongues. And it was the sweetest, most heavenly sound I've ever heard. It was incredible. It was awesome. The congregation worshiping. It's not the congregation come and listen. It's the congregation come and worship. Sermons have left the simplicity. Prayer and so many of the Father's houses of worship across this great land, it's turned into entertainment and a show. It's become how complicated can we make it? How many lights and how much smoke during worship do you have? Oh, we've only got seven different colors. Oh, we've got 15. We've got two smoke machines. Oh, we've got five. I mean, I hear this stuff. Oh, Jesus, how far have so many churches strayed from that? And, and we, it's not that we don't encourage the congregation to lish, listen. Yeah, I get it. It's a new age, technology and all that. But let's just pray that doesn't mean the new age is deceiving the church, that we lose the simplicity of it. Our prayer should be, Jesus, forgive me if I've been corrupted from the simplicity of you, of your word in my life? Am I more excited about the events at church or the programs that I might study than just sitting with you, loving on you, being in love with you, being cleansed by you, like in those early days? Now, of course, there are people who don't even know what the church was like 30 years ago. You don't hear the rustle of the pages anymore. And the, the pastor would say, oh, I'd love to hear the sound. It's, it's so beautiful. There's a whole generation that doesn't even know the sound. Oh, Lord. Paul is saying the serpent corrupted Eve by confusing her, complicating what God had said. Verse 3, how was Eve seduced? Not by being offered a sip. No, it wasn't the demon alcohol, the distilled spirit in the bottle. That It wasn't by a peek at the wrong guy. Oh, look at that hunk over there. Yeah, I got Adam, but look at that. There was no other hunk. Adam was it. <laughs> it wasn't by a puff. Oh, you know, marijuana, that's the demon. No, none of those things. It was by the potential to be more spiritual. You can do something that's going to put you on a higher level. So too, false teachers came into the Corinthian congregation saying that Paul's teaching was too simple, that there was something deeper that they needed to explore and experience, that more knowledge will make you more spiritual. The tree of knowledge of good and evil will get you there. Shouldn't we just get back to sitting down with Jesus in relationship? 
Let's do it for a moment. Lord, we come before you, lifting up your word, Father God. We thank you, Jesus, that you did write it and that those that heard it were faithful to write it down. It was you making their hands move, their mind write words down. And Lord, we come and, Father, we come to know your presence, to feel your presence here with us right now. Lord, I thank you that when we seek you out like this, that we come so close to you. We're right alongside of you, the chaste bride, chaste bride, clean, cleansed, holy, spotless in your righteousness. You're the river overflowing all over us, cleansing us. We thank you, Lord. Bring that joy into our hearts, almighty God. Of just being in your presence, like when, when we were the courting our, our spouse and just sitting there on a bench in the park, hugging each other was enough. We didn't have to get into a big dialogue or anything. We could just love on each other. So, Lord, let us love on you each day. Thank you, Jesus, that we can. Heal us, Lord. Cleanse us. Fix us. Bring us to that simplicity. Amen. You see, a wedding day, people, should be like a moment like this. Now what happens is we have these gigantic weddings and we get so stressed out and the mother of the bride, I've had to tell so many mothers, hey, it's not your wedding. It's hers. It's theirs. Not yours. But they want everything to be perfect and they get all stressed out. Well, it's not meant to be complicated. A wedding's meant to be something that's relaxed and enjoyed. And there's a bond and there's an aura, if you will, a presence, an essence of simplicity, not a major stress cluster. As the serpent deceived Eve, the church might be deceived if we complicate. In 1 Timothy 4, Matthew 25, Luke 21, and many other scriptures speak of the return of Christ coming for his bride. It's not going to be a stressful thing. Jesus had more to say about that than anything other, any other topic. But here's how the serpent beguiled Eve. He didn't say, hey, look at that other hunk. Because as I said, there was no other hunk. There was only Adam. He didn't say, you can have anything in the garden or smoke this and it'll blow your mind. No. He didn't approach her on carnal terms. He approached Eve on spiritual terms, and that's where she was vulnerable. First of all, Satan questions the word of God. That's what he does. Hath God said you can't eat of any tree in the garden? Did God say that? No. Satan has not changed. He always will question the, the word of God. Hey, the world's changing, people. Things have changed. This is now acceptable. Get with it. Catch up with the times. This is no longer forbidden fruit. Be tolerant. First thing the enemy does, he questions, is it the word of God? Is it true forever? Did God say you can't eat of any of the trees in the garden? What God said was very generous. He said just one tree you can't eat of. You can eat of all the other trees. Scholars think there may have been more fruit back then than we even have available today, and some of it may be extinct. That was available. But of course, the way we are, we hear that and we say, oh, which tree can I eat of? Is it that one? Or is it that one? Oh, it's that one? Oh, huh. 
oh, okay, I'm not eating of it. I'm just feeling it, just tasting it. I would never eat it. Then when no one's looking, oh, yeah, check that out. First thing he does, the enemy, he questions the word of God. Did God really say that? Second thing he does, he denies the word of God. You shall not surely die if you go and taste it, if you touch it. You're not going to die. Come on. God loves you. He denies the word of God. He questions. He denies. Hey, man, you're a Christian. You're saved by grace. You know, even if you ate that fruit, you're not going to die. And you need to adjust to the culture. Yeah, that fruit used to be dirty and slimy and bad, but but nowadays, you know, not so. Nowadays, laws have been passed. Nowadays, society's thinking is different. And it, it's really not so bad. You can have more. God wants you to have everything, don't, doesn't he? Well, the enemy's not changed. He questions the book. He denies the book. And then what does he do? He replaces the book. Substitution. You know, we live in this Western culture, educated, technologically advanced culture. But the enemy is so far more advanced than any of our technology. He knows how to get to us. The spiritual realm is head and shoulders over any technology that we will ever have. So first question, second deny, and then substitute. Paul tells the Corinthians, with God's jealousy, jealous over you, betrothing my daughter to one particular husband, Jesus, and I want to present you as chaste, chaste virgin, and I'm afraid as Satan deceived Eve, he's going to deceive you. Simple message, a six-year-old. Now, mind you, people, a six-year-old, an eight-year-old should be able to hear the message that you give and say, I want to, to know Jesus. I want to have Jesus in my life. Simplicity. Matthew 19, 14, Jesus said, Suffer the little children who come unto me. The children can come unto him. Jesus loves us. He's died for us on the cross at Calvary. Our grandkids know it, five and six. They know this. They knew it when they were four and five. If we come to him in faith and we ask for forgiveness for our sins, what's sin, Grandpa? Sins when you do bad. Oh, okay, you know that. You get punished for sin sometimes, right? Yeah. Well, Jesus comes that you be forgiven. Oh, okay, Grandpa. I get it. And he died on the cross. Oh, but he rose, arose again after three days. Ah, it's simple enough. The Corinthians fell in love with him. They had that simplicity of that love. Didn't know what an epistle was. Didn't know what an apostle was. Didn't know any of that stuff. Never mind propitiation or any of that stuff. But they had a love for him. They made their mistakes. They blew it on and on and on, and so do we. But no matter how bad our past is, we're forgiven. There's just a simplicity and a beauty to this whole marriage thing. I've had people blown away when they found out I became a Christian, just totally blown out of the water. Oh, come on. That's an Internet rumor. That can't be true. Then when they found out that I became a Christian pastor, and some of them actually checked out Christianity because of it. They said, if that guy changed, you know, anybody must be able to change, and it must be something real to that. My relatives, my Catholic parents, accepted evangelical Christianity, because not because of my argument with them. When I argued, it didn't work, but because of the longevity of my walk. And they saw, they said at first, oh, he's just, this is like when he went to India for three months and met the Dalai Lama and did the guru thing and meditation up in the Himalayas and all that. It's just one of those passing phases. But then when they saw change in my life, and that year after year, it held. They accepted that 
evangelical Christianity is Christianity. They remain Catholics, but they love the Lord. Verse 4, for if he who comes preaches another, the Greek word is allos, another Jesus, whom we have not preached. Or if you receive a different message, a different spirit, heteros, a different spirit of the same kind, a different spirit other than that of Christ, which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Even though you didn't accept these things, if, you know, you may, you're fallible. You may end up believing them. And he picks up the same theme as in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8. Galatians chapter 1, verse 8. When he says, if an angel comes, not a demon, but if an angel comes, and they, in that culture, angels were big. Angels visited, and they were thought to be, not thought to be, they were big. Not big in size necessarily, but they were respected. If an angel comes and preaches another Jesus, another gospel, let him be accursed. Let him go to hell. If there's a single issue in the New Testament that's the hill to die on, and there is, it's over the issue of the deity of Jesus Christ. It's over the virgin birth, the death on the cross, the resurrection, and the return of Christ. That's the simple hill we stand on, the hill of the cross. And be careful not to lose sight of the simplicity that you don't end up, you may well put up with it. Otherwise, you may swallow it, hook, line, and sinker without ever knowing you were hooked. Paul says what we taught was simple, beautiful with the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of Christ comes and convicts us, convicts the world of sin, There's sin, there's righteousness and judgment to come. That's what happens. There are things that are wrong. Those things are what? Sin. There are things that are right. Those things are what? Righteousness. Plain and simple. And we came to a place of understanding right from wrong when we became born again. Yeah, I was in a mess. Now I need help. I'm on the wrong side. I thought I was on the right side, and there were consequences. But simplicity drew me to Christ, and I was saved. If you're listening to something complicated, another heteros gospel, remember Galatians 1.8. We live in a world today, and the church that surrounds us, that's trying to be relevant to the culture, friendly and everything, because we don't want to lose people. We don't want people leaving and going to a place where they're not confronted, they're not made accountable. And so we water it down. There's the temptation not to talk about things that might be offensive. And the church is succumbing to that temptation without a doubt. We're under threat. Oh, you know, if, if you say something like that and it's on the Internet, then... Next thing you know, we had an elder in the church one time, not an elder now, but way in the past, who said, you know, we better not say that because next thing you know, they're going to be out here, we're going to be on the news, and they're going to be picketing out front. So what? Do that, and a bunch of more people will come. <laughs> it won't be a negative. It'll be a positive. Paul says, don't be deceived. There's one gospel. It's at the foot of the old rugged cross. Things haven't changed in 2,000 years. Solomon says nothing new under the sun. We're, we're at the end time. I believe it. I mean, look at things. Jesus is coming. It's so simple. Don't let me be corrupted from stuff around me on the horizontal. Lord, you saved me. And I didn't know theology, apologetics, hermeneutics. But I loved you. I freaked out. I had a new life. My sins were gone. I was forgiven. I didn't know anything, but I knew this. I was lost, and now I'm found. This morning, let's, let's say that. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was, that's with some heart and conviction. I was lost, and now I am found. Amen? Does it get better than that? Well, you see, for me, it's the simplicity of my salvation of the day that I was born again, that I stand on, and no matter what they say out there and change right from wrong or wrong to right, no matter what, I know that I was saved. 
I was saved from drowning. I was saved from burning up in fire and hell and before I knew anything. And that's what I stand on. I was called to be a pastor. That's what I stand on. And it's by the grace of God that I've made it 28 years or more, actually, 30-something years, counting the church in L.A. It was even more of a miracle by the grace of God that I made it through the, the four and a half years in L.A. than up here. The gospel is only relevant to the culture in that it exposes the sin of any particular culture and offers forgiveness. When it stops doing that, it's another gospel. And today, the world we live in is trying to lower every standard. Oh, but pastor, it's so hard being a Christian. You know what? It's not hard. Come on. It's impossible. It's impossible. But all things are possible in the miraculous truth of the Savior. From Genesis to, Genesis to Revelation, the first three chapters are about what man needed to do. By the third chapter, it was all messed up. It was a disaster. It was hopeless. And from then on, the Bible's about God fixing it. And ever since, he's still been fixing it. But don't let them deny, don't let them question, deny, replace. And I think, personally, it's all going to come around, to be honest. I was having a conversation with Ann Hannes yesterday. And it's all going to come around. All this complicated and whatnot, all this show and smoke and mirrors and, and, and lights and all that, entertainment and everything, what, it's going to all come around. Like, as I, I bet in Puerto Rico right now it's already come around. Take the electricity away. And they're getting down to, to this. There's no projection. There's no amplification. You're going to hear the congregation because there aren't as many people up here as there are down there. But it's going to come down to this. And I'm sure it is that down to this there. Santa Rosa, I don't know about. Different culture, different world than Puerto Rico. They have electricity. But let's pray. Lord, let us be alone with you at times, Lord. Let us have that simplicity and remember, this is a relationship, Lord. That should be the center of everything, Lord. And we so easily forget that. We'll have a potluck and it'll be about the food and the auction and, and whatnot. And that's not wrong. Nothing wrong with that. But all too often in the stress of life, we forget. It's about you. When we were first saved, we had a joy, we had love. Melt us, Lord, again with your, your love and your grace. Let it stagger us, Lord. Not that we get slammed by conviction or challenges or any of that stuff, but we get poured on with love. We need to be convicted. We need to be accountable. But first and foremost, we need to stagger because our knees bend, our hearts break, our tears flow because we're with you in your presence. Renew us, Lord, in these last days. Renew us, Jesus. Restore us. Refresh us, Jesus. Let us not forget each day when we're struggling, when we're going through, when the Verger family is going through the season of the loss of the Father. I'm sure Chris is going to bring the simplicity of the Word of God as the comfort. And Lord, with this world scene, when people talk to us and people say, oh, this is happening, that's happening. Yeah, well, the Bible says so. Yeah, perfect time for Jesus to return. What's that about? Oh, it's about Jesus who long ago predicted all this, prophesied all this. The prophets did also. Throughout the word of God, we see it. Really? Yeah, let me show you. Lord, we come and we thank you that you showed us this morning, Lord, that we can just have that wedding moment, that wedding day, each day of the week. We thank you in your name, Jesus, Lord, for this relationship, Lord. And Father God, let us see the sign that we need signs. We're a generation that looks for something, and it's good to have. And up at the retreat when we were baptizing men in the Holy Spirit, and 
Father, the, the, the men came up and, and the, I was just doing what I do, what, it, what I was asked to do up there as a pastor. And Father God, all of a sudden my body just went le electric, my entire body. And I was really concerned. I was hanging on to the guy because I thought I might fall down. It's late in the spirit. I had been joking with Tim, the pastor up there, about it. And, and he, as he had said to, to me in front of every, uh, all the guys, hey, can do it however you do it down there in Roseville. And I jokingly said, oh, we slay him in the spirit. Next thing I know, I'm, I'm having a hard time even standing. And then it subsided. And then the next guy came up and same thing happened, a roar of electricity. Well, Lord, that was neat. But that's not what I stand on. I stand on the cross. I stand on the resurrection. I stand on your return. return. So Father God, we thank you that you do from time to time throw us a bone, as I like to say. And we appreciate it. In your name, Jesus, we pray. And we all said, amen. Okay, people, God bless. If you need prayer, come on up. We'll pray for you. Be glad to or pray with someone you came with. Fellowship a little. You know, spend a little time with each other. Sometimes it's like we just rush out of here, like, like some kind of tornado swirling on our way out.